Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very, very busy day, and I'm getting ready for my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school getting ready for that course that's starting up um, Monday, February 8th, uh, 2021, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you'll hear more about that. And, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of reading and getting ready for today's show. And we're going to deal with a topic. There was a big article from the New York Times from Tuesday, um, well, there was a, there was a article from the New York Times from January thirty first, twenty twenty one, dealing with the plight of African American farmers, and then there was a uh, article from uh, Black Enterprise Magazine from Tuesday, uh, February second, and. Black farmers say they are on the brink of extinction. Black farmers say they are, are they are on the brink of extinction. Uh, it's a big article from Black Enterprise. There was one from ABC News uh, also that's cited in the Black Enterprise article. And two of Joe Biden's priorities on his platform dealing with racial inequality and climate change can help african-american farmers in the plight of african-american farmers there is a uh, bill in the senate that is co-sponsored by senators cory booker of new jersey and senator elizabeth warren of massachusetts and senator kirsten gillibrand of uh, new york called the justice for black farmers act the justice for Black Farmers Act. Now, I've talked about this before uh, on the show late 2020. I talked about the Justice for Black Farmers Act. And when you deal with this, when you study this, and, uh, you know, going back uh, a couple of years ago, we talked about how African American farmers were suing, uh, they filed a lawsuit because they were saying that they were sold um, fake soybeans. And they thought it was a plot to steal their land. And there's a history of African-Americans having their land stolen from them through various schemes, et cetera, uh, farmland, et cetera, things like this. Um, And they thought that this was uh, one of those uh, schemes. Uh, I talked about that a couple of years ago. I did a, a few broadcasts. So some of you may have seen that. And uh, the farmers, these African-American farmers were suing the Stein Seed Company. OK, now, of course, the Stein, Stein Seed Company said, no, the 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 uh, soybeans were not fraudulent or anything like that. But when you research this topic and I've been following this for uh, the past few years, when you research this topic, it also deals with how. Donald Trump's trade wars with China had a devastating impact on many African-American farmers. And this is something I was talking about real time while it was happening, while the trade wars were happening. John Wesley Boyd Jr., who's the president of the Black Farmers uh, uh, Association, talked about this. He was interviewed uh, by Roland Martin on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And this deals with, once again, how policies impact economics, how policies and laws and regulations impact economics and impact your business. So we'll talk about um, African-American farmers and um, policies dealing with racial inequality and climate change and how they can help African-American farmers. And also we'll deal with the Uh, Justice for Black Farmers Act, the Justice for Black Farmers Act. 
Once again, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics impacts every aspect of our lives, from the water we drink to the air we breathe to the food we eat. Okay, so uh, we'll discuss that. And then... Also, there was a uh, a really good article from face to face Africa.com. Face to face Africa.com. We posted this today on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And this deals with uh, five African American owned radio stations. Five African uh, five African American owned radio stations created a black radio app after iHeartRadio turned them down and refused to carry their uh, radio stations and their podcasts on the iHeartRadio app. So this is, the name of this app is called Umoja, Umoja Radio app. And this is a good story dealing with, uh, could be cooperative economics, but dealing with unity and African-American owned businesses pulling their resources together okay now these are all radio stations that are outside the market of 19 a.m superstation wfdf these are all out of state but this is a good story and we posted this on our facebook fan page the african history network so this is a good story of african-american owned businesses also working together as well all right now we know you can i'm not telling you don't down, download the iheart radio app of course you can Download the iHeartRadio app because you can listen to 19 a.m. Superstation, WFDF Live there. And you can, we have podcasts of the African History Network show there also. We have a, a page there as well. But you can also download this app as well. So we're going to deal with that story. Um, and then today, uh, February 3rd, is the uh, anniversary of the adoption of the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which uh, guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. At the time in 1870, did not apply to African-American women, okay? Um, the women in general are not gonna get the right to vote until uh, the 19th Amendment of 1920. But we'll talk some about the uh, 15th Amendment of uh, 1870. And there was a good article from um, SmithsonianMag.com, from SmithsonianMag.com, uh, official website of the Smithsonian Institute. And I've dealt with this before. I actually did a presentation uh, in early February of 2020 because i didn't do that many presentations in february i didn't do that many presentations in 2020 because of uh the trump virus um uh, not racism but coronavirus the trump virus coronavirus the trump virus so there was a uh article from smithsonian mag that deals that deals with does uh, an amendment give you the right to vote? Does an amendment give you the right to vote? And I actually did a presentation about this uh, in early in early February 2020. Because nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. A lot of people don't know this. Nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. Uh, the 15th Amendment guarantees the right to vote. But then the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gives states rights. So states have a lot of say over who gets to vote. But February 3rd, 2020, was the sesquicentennial or the uh, 150th anniversary of the adoption of the um, 
of the adoption of the uh, 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So this is why in uh, 2020, February 2020, the theme for African American History Month was uh, African Americans and the vote. African Americans and the vote. This was the annual theme for African American History Month in the year 2020, February 2020. And as I as I said, uh, well, as I talk about each year when we do it African American History Month, there's an annual theme. You don't have to just recycle the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year that a lot of uh, African American History Month celebrations have devolved into because people haven't studied Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and haven't studied why African American History Month was created in the first place. So it becomes a um, celebration of um, African American personalities, the first Negro to do this, the first Negro to do that, runaway slaves, things like this. That's not what it's designed for. Yes, that's part of history, but it's, it's much deeper than that, okay? So there's an annual theme each year. This year's annual theme is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. The Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity, focusing on the historical impact and study of African-American kinship and African-American families. This year theme, this year's theme highlights history, literature, the visual arts and film studies, sociology, anthropology and social policy of the African-American family or the black family. The theme also takes a look at the representation and identity of African-American families, which have been subject to vilification and stereotyping from slavery to present. So when I do my presentations on African American History Month, we, I get deep into this. We deal with the annual theme, we deal with the history, we deal with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, we deal with the Great Migration, different things like this. Okay, so we're, we're gonna talk about these topics uh, on today's show. Now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can, can, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 and sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, email us at AHN show at African history network.com AHN show at African history network.com uh, for more information dealing with the online course that I'm teaching uh, starting Monday, February 8th, 2021, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to be uh, it's a 16 hour online course that I teach. You can watch from around the world. It's eight consecutive Mondays. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? So uh, you'll hear more, hear more about that as well. All right, uh, we're coming up here on a break in just a minute. Then also, we have our, uh, have a, because it's African American History Month, uh, I have a 15 DVD bundle pack, uh, the Michael M. Hotel Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack that includes 15 of my lectures including uh, those dealing with the history of African-American History Month and uh, lectures on different uh, topics. Okay, that's available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. We just posted a link here for that also. You'll hear more about that. All right, we're coming up here on a break. Um, 
Also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website. All right, we're coming up on a break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History Mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics like history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021. We are live. So it is African American History Month. We've been talking about that uh, past few days. I want to go to this story here. We're going to go to this clip here in just a minute, uh, Shakita. Uh, 
so African American farmers say they are on the brink of extinction. On the brink of extinction. Now, there's a uh, a big article from uh, BlackEnterprise.com uh, that deals with uh, African American farmers, and there's also a big article from the uh, New York Times. If we look at the article here from uh, Black Enterprise, and I'm going to pull it up here. Um, black farmers say they're on the brink of extinction. Uh, African-American farmers made up 14 percent of the U.S. farming population in 1910. In 1910. OK, 1910 is about five years before the uh, Great Migration started, which was from about 1915 to 1970. But today, African-American farmers make up just 1.4 percent of the population and discriminatory practices within the government are to blame. Discriminatory practices within the government are to blame. Uh, so we pull up this. We have this article pulled up here. Let's take a look at this. Now, agricultural communities across the country were suffering before the coronavirus pandemic as former President Trader in Chief Donald Trump's trade wars with China hurt the industry in more ways than one. And you had, for instance, soybean, you had uh, uh, soybean uh, markets with China closing up and they had to find other uh, markets. You had uh, you had to, you had to have a round of uh, uh, loans going out to farmers because of the trade wars. And when you had the partial government shutdown in um, early 2019, going into January 2019, because uh, Democrats won the midterm election in November 2018. And then in December 2018, uh, you had the uh, uh, partial government shutdown. Trump walks out of the uh, meeting with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, dealing with the infrastructure bill. And then you end up with a 35 day partial government shutdown. OK, well. What happened was that delayed the uh, loans that were supposed to go to the farmers. OK, when he had that partial government shutdown, a 35 day partial government shutdown that delayed money going to the farmers that were supposed to help them because of uh, the, the trade wars with China and losing the uh, uh, China soybean market. OK, so you had and this was on top of the problems farmers were already having when you go back and look at. Uh, the results of the trade war. And even before that, you saw a, 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 a pretty significant increase in the amount of bankruptcies that farmers uh, were filing. OK, one report I saw uh, said the, 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 the bankruptcies increased by 20 percent. You also had an increase in suicides by farmers as well. OK, so agricultural communities across the country were suffering before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Now, African American farmers, uh, as, as former President Donald Trump's trade wars hurt the industry in more ways than one. However, black farmers have had to deal with a whole different set of issues. Okay, a whole different set of issues. Now, African American farmers told the Associated Press that, in addition to the many challenges, challenges. Um, uh, white farmers face, they have to deal with less access to credit and technical support. They have to deal with less, less access to credit and technical support, which make it harder for them to update equipment, purchase seed, operate their farms and buy more, uh, and buy more land. Okay. So they're operating, they have to compete, but they're operating uh, at a deficit. 
Now, African-American farmers also said they have to deal with racial bias almost at almost every level of government that has pushed them off their land. They have to deal with racial bias at almost every level of government that has pushed them off their land. Now, the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's USDA Farm Service Agency typically relied on local loan authorities to make uh, loan decisions. Many of these authorities were in majority white rural areas leading to discriminatory and racist practices, leading to discriminatory and racist practices. Quote, they do not want black farmers to have any farm ground whatsoever. Farm ground gives you power. Farm ground gives you power. Not a lot, but it gives you some power, said Rod Bradshaw, a black farmer who raises wheat, cattle and Milo. He said this to the Associated Press. Now, there's uh, also a uh, big article that abcnews.go.com has is a link to that article in this one here from Black Enterprise. The Pigford settlement in 1999 worth $1.25 billion was intended to support African-American farmers who said discriminatory practices kept them from obtaining loans and other government assistance, but few, if any, African-American farmers have benefited. The Trump administration did not help either, as the former president never filled the position of Assistant Secretary of Civil Rights. And there were a lot of positions that went vacant in the Trump administration, or you had heavy turnover. So in the Trump administration, he never filled the position of Assistant Secretary of civil rights. Now, the agency announced in October 2020 that it would commit $19.1 million to support disadvantaged veteran farmers and ranchers. But farmers say it's not enough and aren't and they are not positive the funds will reach them. The few minority farmers left in the U.S. are now hoping the Biden administration will pass the Justice for Black Farmers Act, the Justice for Black Farmers Act. OK, now you probably need you probably gonna need. Uh, um, uh, you, I think you gonna need some Republicans to vote for this in the Senate. I think you need 60 votes for this act. OK, the Justice for Farmers Act. Now, the bill, which is co-sponsored by Senators Cory Booker. Elizabeth Warren and Kirsten Gillibrand will enact new policies to end discrimination within the USDA, protect current black farmers from losing their land and provide land grants for a new generation of black farmers. Quote, overtly discriminatory. So, so once again, see, this deals with understanding how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics impacts every aspect of our lives. This is why in 2016, when you have people saying, we don't need to vote, we just need to do economic empowerment, invest in the stock market, okay, and build businesses, I said, that's good. My degree is in business administration. I understand that better than most people. I taught entrepreneurship for seven years, help people get funding for businesses, help, help them uh, critique business plans. I wasn't going to write their business plan for them. Help them get funding, things like that. That's, a, that's good, but also I understand the role of government. I understand that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, that adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And I understand you need a president an office whose policies will protect the economy that your business, that your black business depends upon to survive. Subsequently, you, 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 we had an incompetent president 
for four years, Donald Trump. And as of April of 2020, because of the coronavirus pandemic, we lost 41 percent of African-American owned businesses. By the end of this, by the end of 2020, it was probably at 50 percent at least. This is this is an example of how elections have consequences. Then we look at the devastating impact the Trump administration has had on African-American farmers. Elections have consequences. So, oh, quote, overtly discriminatory and unjust federal policy has robbed black families, has robbed black families in the United States of the ability to build and pass on intergenerational wealth, Senator Cory Booker said in the statement. We're dealing with the results of laws and policies. Now you have some people like Jared Kushner. He's probably lowering, he's probably surrounded by lawyers right now. You have people like Jared Kushner that say, oh, black people just need to try harder. But you don't want to deal with a history of laws and policies put in place to maldistribute wealth, power, and resources into the hands of Europeans and take away what we had. When it comes to farming and agriculture, we know that there is a direct connection between discriminatory policies with, within the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the enormous land loss we have seen among black farmers over the past century. The Justice for Black Farmers Act will work to correct this historic injustice by addressing and correcting USDA discrimination and taking bold steps to restore the land that has been lost in order to empower a new generation of black farmers to succeed and thrive. If you read the book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, in the book, one of the things they talk about is the theft of land. And they deal with policies like from the uh, like the Farmers Home Administration. Page 72 of the third edition. Farmers Home Administration created in 1930. Now, this is right after the stock market crash of October 1929 that brings about brings about the Great Depression. And. They say at the end of legal slavery in 1865, African-Americans were concentrated in the agricultural sector of America because in the year 1900, at the turn of the century, 90 percent of African-Americans lived in the South. It wasn't because we liked the heat. It was a legacy of slavery. They were more likely than whites to own farms. African-Americans were more likely than white people to own farms. Though they held less acreage and had poor quality tracts of land. Despite this reality, the Farmers Home Administration, the FHA, the Farmers Home Administration, was set up in 1930 to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operations. This is a, an example of how laws and policies were put in place to maldistribute wealth pond resources. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth pond resources. So when I hear people telling black people don't vote, first question I have to ask is who the hell is paying you to tell us don't vote? Because that's stupid as hell if you understand history and law and policies. The Farmers Home Administration was set up in 1930, set up by the federal government to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operations. To achieve this, now 1930, that's President Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover won the 1928 presidential election. He was a Republican. Republicans used the Southern strategy, even though Candace Owens is lying, saying the Southern strategy doesn't exist. That's not true. Look, Candace, go do some research, study some history. Republican, this is 1928. You have the uh, what's called the Lily White Movement of 1928. 
This was a movement to push African-Americans out of the Republican Party and to appeal to Southern segregationist Democrats in five former Confederate states to get them to vote for Herbert Hoover as president. This is during the, uh, towards the beginning of the Great Migration and more African-Americans are moving from the South up North and they're going to work in jobs and factories and they're voting. So Herbert Hoover becomes president in 1928. They, the Republicans are ignoring the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. The, the Ku Klux Klan is becoming very powerful in, in 1920s. The Klan was rejuvenated in October of 1915 by uh, Reverend um, uh, William Joseph Simmons. Reverend William Joseph Simmons, after he saw the movie The Birth of a Nation, which debuted February 8th, 1915, in the first 30 days, the movie The Birth of a Nation was out. It was called The Klansman. The Birth of a Nation is based upon a novel by another man named Reverend Thomas Dixon. These are good white Christians. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say they're white Christians, but well, they, well, they were. I mean, well, you know, they were. You know. Anyway, um, <laughs> Reverend Thomas Dixon wrote the novel The Birth of a Nation. Okay. And what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Not hate speech or anything like that. I'm, I'm this is documented history. I'm telling the truth. So the movie The Birth of a Nation helps to rejuvenate the Ku Klux Klan, which had largely died out by 1915. They were founded 50 years before in 1865, December 24th, 1865, in Pulaski, Tennessee. So you have uh, Republicans ignoring the needs of African Americans, and then African Americans are going to slowly switch over to the Democratic Party. That shift starts with the 1928 presidential election. Even though majority of African-Americans who voted, voted for Herbert Hoover, you start to see that shift with that 1928 presidential election. 1932 presidential election, Herbert Hoover loses re-election because he mishandles the economic catastrophe of the Great Depression and President Roosevelt wins. And African-Americans are starting to gradually switch over under President, Ro President Roosevelt. This is long before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. By 1960, two thirds of African Americans had switched over to the uh, Democratic Party. Okay, because because they were because we saw even even under Roosevelt, we saw that they were more receptive to our needs. They weren't perfect; we were still leery of them, but they were more receptive to our needs and issues and concerns than the Republican Party was. So you had this gradual switching over. 1947, 1948 presidential election, Democrats have a pro-civil rights platform. Okay, so you have that gradual switching over. Long story short, um, back to the Farmers Home Administration. And somebody's trying to message me. I don't know who the hell this is. Um, some, some I don't give a damn about. But anyway. Oh, did I say it on the air? Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Farmers Home Administration was set up in 1930 to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operations. To achieve this unstated racist purpose, the, the Farmers Home Administration allowed local whites to operate the program and they, not the federal government, decided who would get those critical benefits. So at the state level, you had, you know, segregationists, things like this, distributing the resources at the at the state level. As a result, black owned farms unable to compete with the well subsidized and well financed white farms fell dramatically from about 900,000 in 1930 to 682,000 in 1939. Just just in that Nine year period of time during during the Great Depression from 1930 to 1939, we lose over 200,000 farms because of a maldistribution of wealth pond resources through the Farmers Home Administration. Many of the whites use the government money to modernize by buying tractors and evicting black sharecroppers. When you look at the article from the New York Times, okay. Um, 
two Biden priorities, climate and inequality, meet on Black-owned farms. Meet on Black-owned farms. Uh, I'm going to pull this one up here. And we're about to go to that clip also, uh, Shakita. Let me know if we have any callers. Uh, two Biden priority, two Biden priorities, climate and inequality meet on black owned farms. So this is dealing with how those issues in, in those policies impact African-American farmers. Uh, let me pull this up. There's a picture in the uh, article. I think it was this article because I read so many on this. I think it was in this article. There's a picture that shows African-American sharecroppers. Yeah, it's this one right here. African-American sharecroppers evicted off of the land they were sharecropping in 1939. This is during the Great Depression. Okay. Let's see if we can uh, do a screen share on this. Then we're going to go to that clip, uh, Shakita. I know she's got it ready for me. Uh, let's see. Let's look at this here. So you have to understand this history because all this, the history, the laws and policies, this is all connected, which ties into the lawsuit of the uh, the Pickford sell settlement in 1999. OK, now this is from the article from the, the uh, New York Times this is a deep is an eight page. I printed it out. I printed it out. I got it right here. Because I, re I I was researching this before we came on the air, I printed out as eight pages. Two Biden priorities: climate and inequality meet on black-owned farms. So you're seeing the connection between policies and conditions, policies and conditions, laws, policies and conditions, and who you vote for, who put the who put the policies in place. You can get something like this under Trump. This is an example of how elections have consequences. The administration has pledged to make agriculture a cornerstone of its plan to fight global the climate change, global warming, but also to take to tackle a legacy of discrimination that has pushed black farmers off the land. You can get this under Trump. So very quickly, if we look at this picture, I'm going to show you the caption. This is evicted sharecroppers in 1939 in New Madrid County, Missouri, during the Great Depression. OK. Um, all right. Let's I, I want to go to this clip here, Shakita. This is from. Um, Al, Jaze Al Jazeera. This is called Why Are All the Black Farmers Vanishing? Why Are All the Black Farmers Vanishing? Let's go to this clip. My grandfather was said, the man knows no color. Never mistreated anybody. You know, people do. This is the story of an injustice that begins with slavery continues through decades of government-sponsored discrimination, and even now is a fight for survival. Black farmers have faced discrimination for centuries, and today there's fewer than 49,000 of them in the U.S. That's less than the entire student body of the University of Texas. We had to fight for the land, fight for the equipment, but the white farmers around here, their land was inherited down. Black farmers lost 80% of their land between 1910 and 2007, in large part because of systemic racial discrimination. Folks are starting to realize that we don't actually have a future of farming unless we include all of the various ethnicities and races in this nation. <laughs> Leah Penniman knows a lot about the history of black farmers in the U.S., in part because her grandmother was a farmer. A lot of people don't know that the 12 and a half million Africans who were kidnapped from their home were mostly rounded up because they were expert agriculturalists. Even after the Civil War ended, the government never delivered on its promise of reparation. 
it said it would give three people a plot no larger than 40 acres and a mule. It didn't. Despite the fact that the promise never happened, we did manage to save enough money to purchase 16 million acres of land by 1910. Black farming hit its peak in 1920, when nearly a million black farmers worked the land. Many black families across the South were sharecroppers. That meant they'd rent and farm small plots of land, and then the landowner would receive part of the crop. But high interest rates and unpredictable harvest often left sharecroppers like John Boyd Jr.'s grandfather, indebted to landowners. He would all, always wind up owing Mr. Hopper money, and, and I couldn't figure that out. I said, how does Sam work? Do you work all year, uh, harvest the crop, and you actually owe, owe the plantation on the money. John is a fourth-generation farmer and the founder of the National Black Farmers Association. His family story is one with a landscape fertilized by black labor. He is part of the 1.4% of black people who make up the country's 3.4 million farmers. The U.S. government has restricted the success of black farmers, and John would become a driver in their fight for equity. I called the USDA the last plantation, the way that they're treated black farmers. We've been uh, degraded, humiliated. For decades, the U.S. Department of Agriculture systematically favored white farmers by denying loans to black farmers. Like his grandfather, John found himself financially struggling to keep his farm. He went to the USDA for aid, and the intense confrontation with a local USDA loan officer nearly ended in a physical fight. The farm operating loan and the USDA loan officer, they spat on me. I just lost it. I literally wanted to whoop his ass. Uh, he said, if you don't learn how to talk to me, uh, you're never going to get a loan in this county. The Department of Agriculture is often the last resort for farmers when they don't qualify for loans from other sources. And discrimination was widespread at its local branches, which were largely run by all white county committees. We filed three applications at the USDA, and six months later, they claimed they couldn't, they had lost those loans or they couldn't find them. Lester Bonner is a 74 year old farmer from an agricultural family. And he says his fight with the USDA started in 1983. The land Bonner and his family tilled for 18 years was owned by a white man who promised them they'd get the first opportunity to purchase the ground. But the government didn't make that easy. We sat in the yard two, three hours, a couple of days, waiting on the guy saying he was going to come out and we were going to fill the papers out. Nobody never showed. Throughout the 1990s, it took an average of 60 days for white farmers to get their loan applications processed. But for black farmers, it took 220 days. Stories of unfair lending practices were so common among black farmers that a group of them, including John Boyd Jr., banded together. Their fight led John and 400 others to sue the government in a class action lawsuit known as Pickford versus Glickman in 1997. I did a lot of the legal work uh, because lawyers said uh, there's no way you're going to win suing the federal government, especially uh, uh, a group of blacks to get paid for something, compensated for something. This taboo had never been done before. But the black farmers did win. Well, kind of. The government settled the case for a little more than $1 billion. The black farmers case was like the next biggest thing uh, to the Voting Rights Act uh, as far as meaningful things that happened to black people in this country. A drop in the bucket for, for what happened from slavery to Jim Crow to, to sharecropping. Nearly 16,000 farmers affected would receive $50,000. Some other farmers received more, but that was only if they filed their claim by a certain date. Many didn't. The so Boyd found himself again fighting for nearly 40,000 claimants. I can tell you, uh, this took 30 years uh, to do so. It's it wasn't something that transpired over a few years. We're talking about a 30-year period before farmers received their final checks out of, this, out of the second uh, lawsuit. The follow-up case, known as Pigford II, gave claimants an additional one and a quarter billion dollars in compensation. But for many black farmers, it was too late. 
you know, the plaintiffs were in their 80s and 90s. It was important because it showed the nation that black farmers did not decline because of a lack of skill or desire to leave the land. Today, the average age of black farmers in the U.S. is about 60. And Leah Penniman's life mission is to cultivate the next generation of young black farmers. Her program at Soul Fire Farm works with black farmers who are mostly in their 20s and 30s offering week-long immersion courses gives me hope, the sense that our generation is awakening to the call of coming back to the land. Leah wants to show that young Black farmers can still connect with the land, despite everything previous generations have endured. Land is the basis of freedom, dignity, and equality. It allows people in our community to see more broadly what's possible for them and that they don't have to settle for what society has been told are the limits of what they can do. Okay, so that is um, from uh, Al Jazeera. That's on YouTube. The name of that clip is uh, The Vanishing. Uh, what was that again? Um, hold on, I'll give you the name of it. Uh, black Farmers. Let's see, what is it? Why are all the black farmers vanishing? Why are all the black farmers vanishing? Okay, so this ties into history. This ties into history. And then also what they didn't mention, there was a $1.3 billion payout uh, for a lawsuit that President Obama did in, I think it was 2013, something like that. Um, um, Blackenterprise.com has an article about this. Um, now, I, I want to go to this clip here. This is uh, Dr. King in 1968. He's speaking at a, um, a a church in Mississippi, and it is he he's talking about what happened after the Civil War to African Americans and how we were not uh, given land, how we were locked out of massive land giveaways, and he talks about white farmers being able to mechanize their farms because of help from the federal government. Okay, uh, I just sent you that clip, Shakita. Let's go to this clip. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farm. Not only that, Today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. Okay, pause it right there. Okay, so that's from 1968, and Dr. King is talking about African Americans, one, being locked out of massive land giveaways like the Homestead Act of 1862, but also when it came to things like the Farmers Home, uh, Farmers, uh, Home Association being locked out of those uh, uh, redistribution of resources, being locked out of those loans. Uh, white farmers were given loans. And they use those loans to mechanize their farms. They're going to be use those loans to pay their mortgages and pay the um, workers on the farm. And African American farmers were largely locked out of those loans, and we end up losing a lot of our farms, losing a lot of that farmland. Okay. Uh, also, check out this article here from um, uh, Black Enterprise. This is from uh, October second, two thousand thirteen. Black farmers to receive payouts. And $1.2 billion in federal lawsuits. This deals with the uh, payout. Uh, th this was tied to a lawsuit, and President Obama authorized the payout uh, 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 of this. Uh, this ties into the uh, Pickford settlement. Uh, this is the second round of funding for black farmers. 
thousands received payments in uh, 1999 uh, as part of a settlement in the class action lawsuit. Okay, that's in 1999 dealing with the Pickford settlement. Uh, after years of protests and lawsuits, black farmers in the South will be will begin receiving payments this week as a result of the one point two billion dollar settlement in the discrimination case against federal agriculture officials. About 18,000 farmers in total are expected to receive checks in the next few days instead of read that article. So that's a drop in the bucket. But that's what that's something that um, John Wesley Boyd was talking about. OK, we're going to continue this. Uh, discussion on our social media platforms, our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. If you're watching, uh, keep watching there. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. WFDF. Remember, right now is correct, wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. Stay tuned for Pastor Greg Davis. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. We're going to keep going. Okay. How's everybody doing? All right, if you like this type of information also, you can donate to the African History Network. You can support us, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps support us, helps us keep broadcasting six days a week. We're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. And Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to help pay for this technology. So let's keep broadcasting. I'm broadcasting through Restream right now. I just paid these jokers $209 for this package. So I can broadcast, show you all this, do the screen share, and then also rebroadcast these shows throughout the day. Okay. So we we we, we rebroadcast these shows throughout the day as well. And some of the broadcasts I've done. And I'm going to start doing rebroadcasts overnight. Also, have to program those, hit people on the West Coast, um, et cetera. Okay, so we definitely appreciate the support. Um, for African American History Month, we have the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack of uh, some of my lectures, the Michael M. Hotel Black History Month DVD bundle pack, 15 DVD bundle pack. And uh, it includes everything from uh, my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther uh, to uh, a presentation I did dealing with the history of African American History Month to uh, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. It's 15 of my lectures. Okay. Uh, it's on sale a hundred dollars. We just posted the link here. It's also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. So we'll talk about that in a, a few minutes here. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have post-paid and profit-sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com. And you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. 
please visit our website at cometicwear.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. I want to go back quickly here to this article uh, from the New York Times. This huge article from the New York Times. Once again, this ties into understanding policy, laws, and conditions, and who's in office. Who can push these policies? Who's receptive to your issues? Who's receptive to you pushing your issues, your agenda, your concern? Okay. Um, if we, once again, if we look at this article here, how's everybody doing? Everybody share this uh, broadcast on your social media platforms as well. African American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Also visit uh, workingwithjohnray.com, workingwithjohnray.com. Uh, John Ray is going to tell you about uh, income shifting uh, also, okay? So you'll hear more about that as well. Vis uh, visit workingwithjohnray.com. Let me uh, go back to this article here. I just want to hit the highlights because this is an eight-page article, and we'll be here for two hours dealing with this because I went through and read the whole thing. It's a deep, it's a deep article. Um, and the one from the one from Black Enterprise is a uh, is like condensed, but the the one from um, New York Times is deep. Two Biden priorities: climate and inequality meet on black on black owned farms. Okay, uh, one of the things they talk about here is let's see here. Let's go down to. Uh, the administration has promised to make agriculture a cornerstone of this ambitious climate agenda, looking to farmers to take up farming methods that could keep planet warming carbon dioxide locked in the soil and out of the atmosphere. First of all, you have a president that is listening to the scientists and realizes climate change is real as opposed to climate change being a hoax. Like Donald Trump said, the majority of his time in office. At the same time, President Biden has pledged to tackle a legacy, to tackle a legacy of discrimination that has driven generations of black Americans from their farms. Now that's totally different than Trump. Trump doesn't even want to acknowledge systemic racism actually exists, not, not in public, not consistently. He may, he may say it. He may say it at a town hall. He may admit it at a town hall meeting for like sixty seconds, but then there's no follow up, no policies to address it. Nothing. President Biden has pledged to tackle a legacy of discrimination that has driven generations of Black Americans from their farms, with steps to improve Black and other minority farmers' access to land loans and other assistance including climate smart production including climate smart production now farms run by african americans make up less than two percent of all of the nation's farms today down from 14 percent in 1920 down from 14 percent in 1920 and see when um uh, when you had the 
uh, Farmers Home Administration and the loss of over 200,000 farms from 1930 to 1939 that did a job on us. Because of decades of racial violence and unfair lending and land ownership policies. Okay, now, uh, oh yeah, so, uh, so Joe Biden's promises come on the heels of a year Joe Biden's po policies come on the uh, on the heels of a year in which demands for racial justice have erupted across America and a deadly pandemic has exposed stark disparities in health. Biden is also seeking to reverse former President Donald John Trump, the traitor in chief, to reverse Trump's unraveling of environmental regulations. So this, so the, Trump reversed over 100 um, uh, environmental policies. There was a article from the Washington, uh, New York Times. There was a big article from the New York Times, and uh, this may be a link to it here. That broke, yeah, this one right here. Y'all have to, now I've talked about this before. And I've dealt with this in some of my lectures. Okay. Go read this article here from the New York Times. The Trump administration rolled back more than 100 environmental rules. Here's the few, the, the full list. This was last updated January 20th, 2021. This goes through and shows how Trump was rolling back, either weakening or totally reversing over 100 environmental policies, some from the Obama administration, put in place by the Obama administration, some left in place from previous administrations and the Obama administration left them in place. This ties into climate change. This ties into the plight of African-American farmers who are fighting against climate change. All of this is connected. Over the four years, the Trump administration dismantled, over four years, the Trump administration dismantled major climate policies and rolled back many more rules governing clean, clean air, water, wildlife, and toxic chemicals. When you do things like this, who do you think this hurts the most? Because we talk about environmental racism. Who you think is hurt the most when you have rollbacks and regulations like this? African American and Hispanic Latino communities. In all, a New York Times analysis based on research from Harvard Law School, Columbia Law School, and other sources counts nearly 100 environmental rules officially reversed, revoked, or otherwise rolled back under Trump. More than a dozen other potential rollbacks remained in progress by the end, but were not finalized by the end of the uh, Trump's term. Quote, this is a very aggressive attempt to rewrite our laws and reinterpret the meaning of environmental protections, said Hannah V. v uh, Viscara, a staff attorney at Harvard's Environmental and Energy Law Program, who has tracked the policy changes since 2018. This administration, the Trump administration, is leaving a truly unprecedented legacy, and it's not a good one. This administration is leaving a truly unprecedented legacy. Elections have consequences. So while people in 2016 was saying we don't need to vote, we just need to do economic empowerment, invest in the stock market and build businesses. They didn't talk about uh, the environment and environmental racism and how that would impact African-American farmers, or how that impacts African-Americans in, in uh, areas that, that are already having problems with uh, pollution, emissions from plants, lead in the waters, not just Flint, Michigan, 
all of this is connected. So this article goes through and breaks this down by category, air pollution and emissions. It deals with the reversals completed, reversals in progress, drilling and extraction, infrastructure and planning, animals, water pollution, toxic substances and safety. So go read this full article here. This ties into the plight of the African-American farmers. The Trump administration rolled back more than 100 environmental rules. Here's the full list. 98 rollbacks were completed. 14 in progress. This is from the New York Times, okay? So I, I've, I've kept up with that throughout the years because I've included that in some of my presentations. All right, I, I want to go back quickly to this article here, the original one from the Times. Uh, there was another section, land trust, another, uh, there's another passage I want to look at. Let's see here. Okay, so we have the sharecroppers, as uh, we talked about before, sharecroppers being evicted in, in 1939. Because when you had white farmers being able to get loans to save their farms from the federal government, okay, some of them got rid of their black sharecroppers. And they were evicted from the land. Uh, let's see, where is that for a brief time? Okay, so for a brief time after emancipation, free black communities spread across the rural South, cultivating all manner of agricultural goods like pecans, peanuts, and pork. By 1920, there were 925,000 black farmers, a fourth of whom were able to secure their own land. The Jim Crow era brought a violent backlash from white landowners and black farmers and sharecroppers became the target of intimidation, bombings, and other attacks. The discrimination and racist violence spurred many black farmers to flee north, often to cities as part of the Great Migration. Now, that wasn't the only reason why they were fleeing north. Part of it was domestic terrorism. We were being ran out of the south. It's part of it. That's not all of it. You have things like um, the bow weevil invasion. You have uh, the, the bow weevil e eating up uh, cotton crops and you know uh, eating up the crops. You have um, okay. So this is 1930 during World War One. Uh, the U.S. World War One is 1914 to 1918. The U.S. gets involved in World War One in 1917 uh, when the U.S. troops go fight in the war. Um, when these white men go fight in the war, this leaves a labor vacuum in a lot of these northern plants. And a lot of these northern plants and factories, they're marketing to African Americans in the South enticing them to come up north and go to work in these plants. So many of us are trying to get out of the South. Some of us are going to keep our farms, but farms, but others who maybe don't own farms or are being ran off the farm, domestic terrorism, they can't pay the taxes on the farm or what have you. Many of us are going up north and going to work in these factories because we were, we were looking for a better way of life. We're looking for equal protection under the law. We're looking for a, 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 a better way of life. So um, you see the beginning of the Great Migration right about 1915. It goes from 1915 to 1970. You have about uh, six, uh, six or seven million African-Americans migrating from the south up north. All right. Uh, then it goes on to say. Disparities in access to loans, disparities in access to loans and aid 
and well-documented discrimination at the Department of Agriculture also drove black farmers from their land. This is just what I was talking about. Even as the civil rights era started to bring black Americans equal rights under the law, the rural exodus accelerated. The rural exodus accelerated as white citizens councils in the South wary of a surge in black voters explicitly targeted black farmers for, for expulsion from their communities. Okay, so read the rest of this. Check out the article from uh, Black Enterprise. Black farmers say they are on the brink of extinction. Uh, read about the Justice for Black Farmers Act, the Justice for Black Farmers Act, co-sponsored by Senators Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren and Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, and you, you're going to you're going to hear more about all of this. OK. Uh, let's go to this next story quickly here. Because I spent more time on the first story than I expected. Uh, we may talk a little bit about the 15th Amendment tonight. We have to talk more about more about that tomorrow. I want I, originally I wanted to talk about the Mexican-American War. Of, of 1846 to 1848 because February 2nd was the anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of uh, February 2nd, 1848, which is what ended the Mexican-American War. And as a result of the Mexican-American Mexican War, the U.S. got California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, all from Mexico as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All that land belonged to Mexico. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Mexican American War, 1846 to 1848, sometime soon in the next couple of shows. I don't know, but we need to talk about the 15th Amendment between uh, today's show and tomorrow's show. Uh, it's just so much to cover and only have so much energy and so much time. Uh, let's see. Last, let's see. Let's see. Um, okay, let's go to this other story here. So I saw this article from face-to-faceafrica.com. And this deals with African-American-owned radio stations, okay? And I used to be on the, um, I used to be on the Empowerment Radio Network. Some of you all know that. That was an African-American-owned radio station. And it's hard, you know, and dealing with it's hard being in African-American radio, especially when it's talk radio. If you play hip hop music, you make more money doing that. Talk radio is very hard. OK, but this story here from face to face Africa dot com. This this is uh, this deals with five African-American owned radio stations after iHeart Radio refused to platform five black radio stations. They came together for a uh, to create a unique black radio app. They came together to create a unique black radio app. And uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Let's pull this all up here from face to face Africa dot com. So across America, black representation in the media uh, space is quite limited thereby affecting African-American voices in national political discourse, as well as in their cultural thoughts. And, uh, and so the stories of African-Americans, uh, and so the stories of African-Americans when it comes to their culture challenges worldviews and political persuasions as told by powerful media channels, mainly owned by white people. So oftentimes we have to go we we're on uh, white networks or uh, stations or iHeartRadio or something like that to get our message out. So if we look at this article here, this is from uh, February second. I think this is February second, February second, twenty twenty one, from um, face to face Africa dot com. After iHeart refused to platform five black radio stations, they came together for a unique radio app.
So a new platform is seeking to change this position and let African Americans tell their own stories. The platform known as Umoja, as the uh, as Umoja Radio App, Umoja Radio App, is a joint effort by the owners of five African-American owned radio stations, w, w, uh, WUVS 103.7, WHPB 98.5, WUGM 106.1, WVBH 105.3, and WQID 105.3. The platform represents the latest chapter of excellence in African American media. And let's see, let's blow this up some more. All right. So the founders of the app decided to create their own uh, app after iHeartRadio refused to allow their stations on this platform. What is particularly unique about Umoja, uh, about the Umoja Radio app, is the development of the app embodies African liberation from the limitation of trans of traditional media, traditional media platforms and traditional gatekeepers. OK, so they came together, pulled their resources together, created their own app. They're going to have podcasts, things like this. So we can get this information out directly to our people. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. I need to see if they can carry the African History Network show. Okay. I need to see if they can carry uh, the African History Network show. Because I have I have podcasts going back to 2010. Oh, I have over a thousand podcasts of, uh, 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 of the show. So this is something extremely important. Okay. They pulled together resources. Ro Roland Martin on his show today, he talked about how African-American media is oftentimes locked out of advertising dollars from, from uh, corporations. And African-American owned media platforms can't grow because we're locked out of the advertising dollars. And he talked about, we have to come together. Or we, we can't just have 20, 30 different platforms and they're all struggling or 20, 30 different media companies and they're all struggling. We have to come together and pull resources together so we can scale, so we can hire more people, so we can have some sustainability, okay? And you can do more. You can reach more people. You can hire uh, 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 writers to write original articles, to produce original content. You can have people out in the field, et cetera. So what is particularly unique about Umoja Radio is that the development of this app embodies African liberation from the limitation of traditional media, traditional media platforms, and traditional gatekeepers. And there's a, a, a Stacey Abrams also, uh, that picture. So the developers of the app chose the name Umoja which in Kiswahili means unity. And that's the first principle when we celebrate Kwanzaa, the first day of Kwanzaa, the first principle of the Nguzu Saba is Umoja. So the seven principles of Kwanzaa, that's not something we just practice for seven days during Kwanzaa and we forget about that the rest of the year. That's something that we practice throughout the year. This is one of the reasons why Kwanzaa is from December 26th through January the 1st. It goes into the new year. So you take those principles with you into the new year, okay? Rhonda said, what's your sign? <laughs> I'm a Gemini, okay? <laughs> that may be good or bad for some people, you know, and say I have a split personality, what have you, but, you know, no, I'm a Gemini, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, so... Let's continue. Now, through the platform, they strive to maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and the human race. The app features over 45 independent Black-owned community-based radio stations with a mission 
of, of Black Empowerment. The app features over 45 independent Black-owned community-based uh, radio stations with a mission of Black Empowerment. Okay, I need to, I need to, they need to carry the African History Network show. Now, the uniqueness of the platform is also to meet the demand for an urban outlet outlet with engaging, educational, entertaining content, whereas other platforms lack diversity and inclusion. The founders uh, say it comes at a time when society demands more inclusive content and we have the potential to deliver that and so much more. Our mission is to grow into the world's largest collective of unapologetically conscious media, unapologetically conscious media, podcasts, and syndicated radio stations. We hope you are able to join us on this wonderful and revolutionary journey. So download this app. Keep listening. Keep watching the African History Network show. Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then watch our broadcast. But in between that, <laughs> download this app here, Umo the Umoja uh, Radio app, okay? Uh, now, Umoja is hoping to achieve uh, instant hit as uncensored podcasts and digital streaming platforms have largely overtaken spaces previously dominated by traditional. Uh, traditional radio record labels and television. Quote, we now have an opportunity to fill a void with Umoja radio app and provide content with inclusion. Black content creators not only steer popular culture, but can now do it from independent platforms and in spaces that we own, according to the founders. Now, the founding of the Umoja uh, radio app comes on the heels of African American History Month and a campaign by Yahoo to make space for Black Voices campaign, make space for Black Voices campaign to honor Black History Month. The programming includes a celebratory Yahoo logo in partnership with creative artist Janelle Young, as well as new video series. Uh, and on-air interviews celebrating Black changemakers and a special live stream event featuring different industry leaders, Yahoo said. Okay, so check out this article here from facetofaceafrica.com. You see we share a lot of their content. This article is by Abu Mubarak from February 2nd, 2021. After iHeart Radio refused to platform five black radio stations they came together to form a unique black radio app they're putting the principles of self-determination and the principles of kwanzaa into practical application because i hear a whole lot of people pontificating and theorizing and they're usually talking about conspiracy theories and all this stuff and I tell people, show me the manifestation of your pontification. That's what I want to see. Show me the manifest, the manifestation of your pontification. Okay, this is what they're actually doing. You have to own something. You have to create something. All right, so check out that article also. Uh, Umoja, U-M-O-J-A. U-M-O-J-A. Umoja radio app. You're able to download that from the Google Play Store or Android Store, you know, uh, iTunes, the uh, Apple um, Store, the Google Play Store. All right. And let's see. Last. OK. All right. How's everybody doing? We have D.L. Gordon, Kim, Rhonda. All right. If you like this type of, type of information, you want to support the African History Network, you can do so uh, through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so if you want to donate 10, 15, 25, 50, 100, whatever, that helps us stay on the air six days a week, keep doing the research, 
pay the bills, help finance the show. Um, you can also set up for a recurring donation through uh, PayPal if you want to as well. The We have our um, my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade with a Dent Teacher in School. It's going to start up Monday, February 8th, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Monday, February 8th, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, originally we were going to do this February 3rd, but I'm still pulling everything together. So it's going to be Monday, February 8th. Um, you can you can register right now um, at our website. Well, I'll post the link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. When you register, it uh, register it registers you uh, for the class I did in 2019. That's all that's already done and archived. You can start watching that bonus content right away, and we'll automatically enroll you into the new class. Okay, uh, so it's regularly 130 dollars. It's on sale 80 dollars. When we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start uh, dealing with it in the 15th century. We can't start in 1441 when the Portuguese go into Mauritania. We can't start in 1619 in uh, Virginia. We have to deal with hundreds of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We know that uh, August 20th, 2019 was the 400th year anniversary of 28 Africans who came into Point Comfort in uh in virginia in august 20 1619 and uh, um 2019 was also known as the year of return so you had many african americans who were uh going back to you know returning to africa going to west africa reconnecting uh with their roots now when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade we have to first understand that african people are the original people of north central and south america the original people of North, Central, and South America. Now, this is not to try to take away anything from our Native American brothers and sisters. And some of us have Native American ancestry. I'm one of them, because uh, I have Cherokee and Blackfoot on my mother's side of the family. My mother, my mother's family is from Tennessee. Okay. Uh, and this is something that Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in the book, The First Americans Were Africans. The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And uh, let me put this, pull this up here. This is something that Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in the book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. So many of you have uh, heard or seen my interviews I've done with him. All right. Interviewed him like 13, 14 times. I need to check with him, see when his new book is coming out. I interviewed him October 12th. So when we started our daily show, uh, Monday, October 12th, 2020, which was incidentally Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. He was my first guest. OK. So I need to check and see when uh, his new book is coming out. But when we deal with and we'll um, show you this right here, we'll do turn on the screen share. And there's also a um, a video that you can watch, which is a preview here as well um so it's a 16 hour online course this is when i did it in 2019 but you can register here you can roll right there and um all that we have about 30 hours of content that's already recorded previous classes you can start watching right away watch from all around the world okay um let's see the So we have to understand that African people, the original people of North, Central, and South America, and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. We can't start studying our history in slavery, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. We can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved, because the Portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, and then the uh, Spanish are right behind them. OK. We have to understand that we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who entered the Iberian Peninsula. Today, 
known as Spain and Portugal from North Africa in 711 AD. So we don't just deal with the transatlantic slave trade, but we deal with thousands of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, so this is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And I uh, posted the link here. As soon as you res register, you can start watching. Um, okay, so we'll post that right here. And that uh, uh, get you will, will automatically enroll you in the class uh, that's starting up. Monday, February 8th, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's going to be eight consecutive Mondays. It's about 16 hours in total. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, uh, show you video clips. We have book references, about 50 articles that I reference. For more information, you can email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. Okay, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Visit WorkingWithJohnRay.com, WorkingWithJohnRay.com. Now, John Ray is going to teach you about a concept called income shifting, all right? And with income shift, shifting, you can do everything from uh, build an emergency fund, uh, get out of debt, begin to buy assets, uh, things that make you money while you sleep as well. Uh, do, do you know? what income shifting is. It takes, it, it, it's taking your money back from those who are taking it from you. That's thousands of dollars a year saved and they will show you how to do this. Okay. Um, visit workingwithjohnray.com, workingwithjohnray.com for more information. All right, let's go to this last story very quickly here working with John. And then I'm going to uh, go over what's in the 15 DVD bundle pack, the Black History Month, the Michael M. Hotel Black History Month DVD bundle pack. We'll go over uh, quickly those um, the presentations in that bundle. I want to go to um, the Zen Education Project. So February 3rd is the anniversary of the 15th Amendment of 1870. And the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. All right. This is five years after the Civil War ends, which ended in uh, June of 1865. So if we look at this from the Zen Education Project, February 3rd, 1870, the 15th Amendment ratified. Uh, ratification to the U.S. Constitution officially granted African-American men the right to vote by declaring that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. However, the promise of the 15th Amendment was blocked for almost a century through the use of poll taxes literacy tests and other means, and more recently by voter ID laws, okay? Um, now, so check this out at the Zen Education Project, all right? Uh, February, so February 3rd is the anniversary, the 151st anniversary of the 15th Amendment being ratified in 1870. Now, there is a a good article that I talked about last year. There's a good article that I, let me show you this here. Um, February 3rd, 1870, 15th Amendment is ratified. This is from the Zen Education Project. Okay. Um, there is a good article from Smithsonian uh, Institute. And this deals with does an amendment give you the right to vote? Does an amendment give you the right to vote? Uh, let me go, where is that one here? It's right here. So this came out February 3rd, 2020, on the 150th anniversary of 
the ratification of the 15th Amendment. And I did a broadcast that day and I did presentations dealing with this. So this was an African-American History Month in 2020. And I did presentations dealing with this. And this tied into the 2020 theme for African-American History Month, which was African-Americans and the vote. African-Americans and the vote. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so it, and and we know that so the, and one of the reasons why the theme for African American History Month in 2020 was African Americans and the vote because uh, that was the 150th uh, anniversary of the uh, 15th Amendment. So if we look at this. So if we look, so if we look at this, if we look at this article here, if we look at this article here, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll be done in a few minutes. <laughs> if we look at this article here from um, the uh, Smithsonian, okay, does an amendment give you the right to vote? Um, in 2020, the 15th Amendment, the first voting rights amendment added to the U.S. Constitution, celebrates its 150th anniversary. You've likely heard perhaps on the news or in the classroom that the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gave or granted African-American men the right to vote. OK, uh, it turned it's a turn of phrase that works as a shorthand. Unfortunately, it's misleading because and the reason why it's misleading is because nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. So the 15th Amendment, it guaranteed the right to vote. But it there's nowhere in the Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. As written. The 15th Amendment does not explicitly grant anyone the right to vote. Instead, it prohibits federal and state governments from placing restrictions. Um, instead, it prohibits federal and state governments from placing restrictions on voting based on three criteria, race, color and previous conditions of servitude. The entire amendment is two sentences long. The, the entire amendment is two sentences long. Section one, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. OK, now, later voting rights amendments to the U.S. Constitution, especially the 19th Amendment and the 26th, 19th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote for women. The 26th Amendment lowered the uh, minimum voting age from 21 to 18. Those two additional amendments copied the. Uh, the 15th Amendment structure and its wording declaring that the right to vote uh, shall not be denied on account of sex or age respectively. All right. So but but the problem with this shorthand, we skip down the problem with this shorthand. Saying the amendment gave African-Americans the vote go deeper than the level. Of language. Perhaps most importantly, this phrasing obscures what happened after the Constitution was amend amended. For a brief time after its ratification in 1870, the 15th Amendment worked as intended, sweeping away laws and constitutional provisions that had prevented African-American men from voting. However, by the end of the 1800s, state governments throughout the South had adopted new laws and regulations that did not directly reference race or color 
but still stripped African American men, but still stripped African American men of their access to direct participation in the nation's political life. Literacy tests, poll taxes, elaborate registration systems, intimidation and violence, including violent assaults and lynchings, were all used to silence African American voters and exclude them from the polls. Okay. Um, so read the rest of this. Check out the rest of this article here. This is from the uh, American History. Si.edu. That's uh, Smithsonian Institute. Uh, American History. Si.edu. Does an amendment give you the right to vote? Does an amendment give you the right to vote? Okay. Uh, from February 3rd, 2020, once again, February 3rd, 2020 was the sesquicentennial or 150th anniversary of the um, 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. All right. Lastly, very quickly here, let's look at this. Um, I, I showed the bundle pack and uh, we have these shipping out uh, this week. Uh, I showed the bundle pack uh, yesterday. Show we'll show it again to you quickly here. So this is the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack, the Black History Month, the Michael M. Hotep Black History Month DVD bundle pack. This is uh, 15 of my lectures. These are on sale. It's on sale right now. The bundle pack's on sale right now, hundred dollars. We ship across the country and ship internationally, so it's going to charge you international shipping. Um. And this is just in time for African American History Month as well. Let's see here. Where is that one here? Okay. So I'm going to show you these uh, presentations that are included in this bundle pack. And this gives a lot of good content for you to discuss and to watch during African American History Month. So you don't have to deal with a lot of the same things because some people are tired. Some people don't like going to Black History Month celebrations, African American History Month celebrations. One, they say they're depressing. Two, it's, you know, the same runaway slave stories they hear, <laughs> you know, all the time, what have you. So I got stuff that people haven't seen before, haven't heard before. Um, so we have, there are 15 uh, presentations. These are all DVD lecture, lectures. I'm doing PowerPoint presentations, things like that. We have uh, a almost three hour presentation I did dealing with the film Black Panther, Black Panther Analysis, African Culture, History, and Afrofuturism. There's a description here for each one of these uh, when you check it out at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, and I did a lot of research dealing with the film Black Panther to be able to do these presentations. We deal with the African cultural influences. We do a lot of history, what the word Wakanda means. Wakanda means possesses secret powers in the Omaha Ponca Indian language and Sioux Indian language. Wakanda is a real word. And key Congo, uh, it, Wakanda is also a key Congo word as well, which is a, a Bantu African language. Uh, and then this one here deals with breaking the chains. This deals with the history of African American History Month, and we deal with Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History that he co founded uh, September 9th, 1915, in Chicago. And it deals with the creation of Negro History Week in uh, uh, 1926, and which became Black History Month in 1976. We deal with some of the annual themes going back to 1928. There have been annual themes each year going back to 1928. So we do a lot of history. And dispel myths about our history also. Uh, dispel myths. The black John Hansen was not president. There were two John Hansons. One white senator from Maryland who was the president of the Continental Congress from 1781 to 1782. He dies in 1783. The black John Hansen was a senator in Liberia. Um, so we do a lot of information here. Um, Africa was not named after a Roman general named Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Actually, Africanus is Latin, which means belonging to Africa or of Africa. So Africa has to exist before you can belong to it. And you read Cassell's Latin English Dictionary, 2002 edition, page 11, in the entry for a fear. It gives you the definition of Africanus. 
And Publius Cornelius Scipio, his family's last name was Scipio. He actually takes his surname Africanus after he conquers that territory. You're dealing with Carthage and the Punic Wars and the people called the Afri, okay? And African people in world history by Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. Clark talks about the Afri, A-F-R-I, on pages 14 and 15. Okay, so you get that presentation. Uh, also, you get uh, Malcolm X 50 years later, why is he still relevant? Uh, you get that one. The distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. I don't deal with the we shall overcome, let's hold hands. I don't deal with that. I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. I deal with the Dr. King that tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott. And he was denied a concealed pistol license. OK, um, so we deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. Dr. King is his whole legacy totally misunderstood, just like Malcolm. Malcolm was misunderstood. And toward the towards the end of both of the, both of their lives, their ideologies are converging. That's why this book here. From. James Cone Jr. is so important. Martin Malcolm in America, a dream or a nightmare because their ideologies were converging toward the end of both of their lives. OK, so you get that one. You get. Um, what else you get? OK, let's go back. You get that one. And. Then the next one is. Oh, this is uh, another one dealing with Black Panther. Lessons from the film Black Panther. Economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and how to Wakanda to vote. I deal with how do we take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and use it for economic empowerment and political empowerment. So that's what I break down in this presentation. And you can order these in the bundle pack. It's cheaper in the bundle, or you can order them individually. Some of these on... Uh, so this is a DVD bundle. We uh, some some of these are in digital download format as well. This one here that deals with the Three Fifths Compromise of 1787 and the Electoral College. And no, the Three Fifths Compromise did not say we were three fifths of a human being. It's talking about for the purpose of uh, representation and taxation. How do you count the uh, population of those enslaved? Okay, for representation in the House of Representatives, the full population. Of African Americans, the full free population of African Americans, 1787 was counted. The kind of three fifths of the population of of enslaved Africans. So, for instance, in Virginia, if Virginia had 100,000 enslaved Africans, okay, they would count three fifths of that. They would count 600. They would count 60,000 as opposed to 100,000 to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives uh, the state of Virginia would have. And then also this deals with the Electoral College. The presentation deals with the Electoral College as well. This one here deals with entrepreneurship. I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. My degree's in business administration. The 13 forms of wealth and redistributing the pain, keys to economic empowerment and entrepreneurship for African-Americans. This is a really good presentation here. And I tie all this into history as well. I tie all this into uh, historical figures, um, examples of entrepreneurship. Uh, the racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. This deals, deals with the whole history of the national anthem, the Pledge of Allegiance. Francis Scott Key, uh, who wrote it September 13th, uh, 1814, during the War of 1812. And I tie, tie all that history into the history of Colin Kaepernick's protests to really understand what Colin, Colin Kaepernick's protests um, was about. This is a double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans, where Africans documented evidence. So we're dealing with the ancient uh, presence of Africans in the Americas. And I also deal with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. This is a four hour presentation redistributing the pain. Um, how African-Americans historically fought back with economic boycotts. I deal with documented examples of different types of economic withdrawal strategies that we've used throughout history. So we understand how to use those today. And that's, um, I referenced Dr. Claude Anderson as one of my teachers. So he's in here. Also, that's a picture. Um, he was speaking in Baltimore. I think that's, yeah, he was speaking in Baltimore. That's from a few years ago. And some of you have seen the interviews I've done with him throughout the years as well. Um, Okay, 
This one here, the light of ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. Another good one. I did this in Lansing, Michigan during African American History Month, February 25th, 2017. Funny story. <laughs> My daughter was born on that day while I was giving the presentation. <laughs> she was overdue and she didn't you know. <laughs> she was. <laughs> My daughter, my daughter's born during Black History Month. Who would have thought, right? <laughs> um, we didn't know she was going to come then, but yeah, my daughter's born during Black History Month, right? <laughs> I guess that's appropriate, okay? Either that or Kwanzaa. <laughs> uh, human guinea pigs: the history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated the the the, uh, the history of the Tuskegee experiment on the Negro male. Contrary to popular belief, they did not inject them with syphilis. There were six hundred men in the study. 299, 399 of the men uh, had syphilis. They had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis, where you have syphilis, but you don't have any symptoms. 201 men in the study did not have syphilis. They were the control group. They were the group you can, they, the control group is the group that you compare the other group to that you are subjecting to the stimuli or the stimulus, or the, the stimuli. Um, so, the, the Tuskegee experiment was bad, but they did not inject them with syphilis. That's just, that's why those memes that you see floating around on social media, it says they injected it with syphilis. That's why they don't cite any sources because they don't have any. That's not what happened. And it was, the, the study was supposed to, it was supposed to last six to nine months, ended up lasting about 40 years, started about 1932, 1933. But this deals with the whole history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis of the Negro male, separating fact from fiction. There's a whole lot of fiction floating around. Um, this one here, a Black Panther analysis for children, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism. I'm presenting to 60 fifth through 12th graders and their teachers. And we're dealing with the film Black Panther, dealing with different themes of the film, how it relates to actual African history, how the teachers can use the different themes in the film to teach actual African history. OK, and deal with African culture also. I did this at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. Uh, this is a really good one. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Is, um, so, so you're going to get the two DVD set. It's uh, like four hours. So we deal with great African women in our history from all different time periods, from uh, Osset to Madam C.J. Walker to her mentor, Annie Turmo Malone, the Queen and Zinga. Um, Yah Santiwa, Asada Shakur, Queen Charlotte Sophia, Angela Davis, all different time periods. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. And, um, oh, this one here African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. So I deal with comparisons between uh, Richard Nixon winning the presidency in 1968 and Donald Trump in 2016. I deal with the rapid voter suppression that took place in the 2016 um, presidential election as well. Uh, so we do a number of different uh, things here. African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, how elections have consequences. I deal with how Donald Trump was a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama and the Black Lives Matter movement. How Richard Nixon was a backlash to the Black Power movement, the civil rights movement and the rebellions taking place in the 60s all across the country. And lastly, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. So this deals with the pre-Christian origins, the, the pre-Christian uh, celebrations that are that that are going to end up forming the celebration of Christmas. We deal with the origins of Christmas. We deal with things like the, the festival of Saturnalia amongst the ancient Romans, um, the festival of Mithra amongst the Persians. Uh, the Festival of Yule. Many of these festivals took place around the winter solstice, around December 21st, or the vernal equinox. March 21st, which marks the first day of spring. Usually vernal is Latin for spring. Uh, we deal with the influences from various cultures, religions, mythology, astronomy, etc. So that's a deep presentation. It's a three-hour presentation. Ancient, Kim, ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice, and the history of Christmas. Okay, it deals with uh, Asar, Osset, and Heru, and Heru being born on December 25th of a virgin birth to Osset. Uh, now, you know, some of this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, 
just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. This means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. But that's all in that 15 DVD bundle pack, the uh, Black History Month, uh, Michael M. Hotel Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack. It's on sale right now. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com is right on the home page. When you scroll down, we just posted the link here as well. We have those shipping out this week. So you can place your orders and your African-American History Month will never be the same again. You're going to have a very, very interesting African-American History Month, okay? Because <laughs> it's not it won't be information that you've heard before, oftentimes, all right? For many people, a lot of this will be some new information. Okay, hey, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics like history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid al Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have postpaid and profit sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, 
small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Gain knowledge in minutes with Blacklist Ed. Blacklist Ed is an app that provides insightful summaries of books pertaining to the black experience. As black people, we know the importance of reading books to discover our incredible contributions to world history, to uplift our self-esteem, and to empower ourselves for our relentless fight for social justice. Unfortunately, with our busy lives, it feels like there is never enough time to read a book. Fortunately, there's a solution. With Blacklist Ed, their app provides key insights from best-selling books about the black experience, therefore saving you time, increasing your knowledge, and empowering yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. You can read or listen on the go. Start your free trial today by going to blacklisted.com. That's black without the C, B-L-A-K. Or you can download the Blacklist Ed app from the App Store or Google Play. Blacklist Ed, and for yourself. Have you tasted the world famous frowny brownie yet from the Pink Bakery? If not, what are you waiting for? They are vegan, gluten free, and free of the big allergens. While eating their no frowny brownies, the fabulous Miss Tabitha Brown said they were very good. Very good. And you know, if she says that, they are. The Pinkery is the first black owned, big eight allergen free baking mix company. Go to thepinkbakery.com, that's thepinkbakery.com, to order their no frowny brownie mix today. Yaya Rule is a line of African print inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist, their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or 